On Tech News Today, the Nest thermostat wants to talk to your garage door opener, Microsoft wants to buy your MacBook Air, and Russia wants Twitter to censor on behalf of the Kremlin. All that and more coming up right now. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, June 24th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used Apple and Android devices are worth at gazelle.com. Tech News Today is a show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Mike Elgin, and joining me is Joe Panettieri, my co-anchor. How's it going, Joe? Oh. He is very there quiet. We there today. we go. Very quiet guy today. Sorry, how, I, how I, you didn't, doing, I didn't mean to mute you right at the top of the show, Joe. Sorry about that. <laughs> He's going to wait until you're mid sentence. an ongoing yeah. theme for those of us it, who join us Tuesday. Really I'm is. muted right. for the first 10 seconds <laughs> just sorry. to see if I'm paying attention. And muting, muting all the co anchors is Jason Howell, of course, the, uh, the man with a heavy hand on the mute button. Very good at pressing the wrong button at exactly the right time. And Jason and I are super excited about Google I.O. tomorrow. We're both going. And, right. you know, there are some people who are excited about some. I don't know, something called the World Glass or the World Cup or something like that going on somewhere. I don't know what that is, but the real event is happening tomorrow in San Francisco. Jason and I are going to be there. You're going to be there for two or three days, right, Jason? Well, I'm going to be there uh, Wednesday and part of Thursday, most okay. of Thursday anyways, but yes, yeah. definitely Wednesday. I'm not going to make it Thursday, but I'll definitely be there all day tomorrow, and I'll be there tonight at a special event, Google Glass whole event, essentially. Uh, and uh, that's going to be great. And so just be we'll mention it again at the end of the show, but tomorrow, Leo Laporte himself is going to be anchoring TNT, and it's going to be a special Google I.O. edition where he'll be covering the keynote live. That's probably going to be a two-hour keynote starting at 9 a.m. Pacific. That's an hour earlier than our normal show. So you definitely don't want to miss that. Uh, Jason and I will be shirtless with lettering on our shirts. So it's a long story. <laughs> You'll see it on the on the video and probably doing the, the newspaper. Wave. That's exactly The Google right. wave, That's of course. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Well, let's jump into the news. One day before Google's developer conference, Google I.O., Nest Labs announced a new developer program and API that opened Nest's Protect Smoke Alarm and Learning Thermostat to developers and other smart home devices. Google acquired Nest Labs in January. And Joe Panettieri, this is uh, both cool and scary because everybody, you know, lots and lots of companies are coming out with their own platform. Everyone right. is saying, we want everyone to talk to each other but as we know, when everybody has a different standard, a different platform, that's exactly what doesn't happen. Uh, but this one is powerful because, of course, Nest is owned by Google. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I think what's interesting here, Mike, is, is to your point, this whole ecosystem play where, yeah, everyone talked to each other. But by the way, uh, we're going to be at the center of the ecosystem is, is sort of the uh, the platform play going forward for, for each of these companies that are trying to compete here. Now, the, the question uh, that I'd like to raise is, is similar to an editorial I saw yesterday, I think, in the, in the Wall Street Journal. Um, can these solutions really simplify going forward? And, and what I mean by that is <laughs> there's not much, much, there aren't things that are much simpler than, than the light switch and, and your home thermostat. And if they're already working pretty darn well, are these new solutions just complicating things or, or does it really get easier? And, uh, you know, as companies like Whirlpool begin to plug, in, to plug into these ecosystems, do things really get better or do you get worse? So, Mike, any early thoughts there? Absolutely. I have two uh, thoughts that are both relevant to the announcement that Nest made, mm -hmm. one of which is the Whirlpool uh, company, which makes washers and dryers and other home appliances. Uh, they're one of the apartment, uh, one of the partners that was announced. Uh, others include IFTTT, the sort of automation uh, website that allows you to build little macros to automate things. Jawbone, Logitech, mm -hmm. Mercedes-Benz, Chamberlain. We'll get into some of these in a minute, but Whirlpool's point is that it's not about convenience it's about energy efficiency. So mm -hmm. they emphasize the fact that, you know, it's a hot day, it's 100 degrees outside, you've got the air conditioner blasting, and you, you're running the washer and the dryer. These can be coordinated, and also they can determine whether or not you're home. So if you leave the house and you have all those things running, uh, they can say, okay, you know what, we're going to turn off the wash, we're going to turn off the air conditioner and just run the washer. When the washer's done, we'll run the dryer. And if you come home, we'll turn on the air conditioner again. That sort right. of thing. That that could be very powerful in terms of, uh, you know, the cost of energy and also energy efficiency and, and it's good for the environment and that sort of thing. So there are little subtle benefits 
that uh, are are totally divorced from the idea of you know is it too inconvenient to turn off a light switch you know that whole question the other right. thing that's really cool the biggest partner of course in all of this was google itself so <laughs> they announced that google now is going to support the nest platform and so that means you just walk in the house you have strategic uh, microphones planted here and there and you just talk and just say you know talk to to google now or you know it'll notify you in some other way but basically you'll be able to interface with your appliances by voice and also you get some sort of preemptive information uh, on your phone or whatever the device is you happen to be looking at. For example, it'll say, you know, your, your dryer needs service or your garage door opener is stuck or, you know, can notify you of little things seamlessly along with all your other notifications. So yep. that's another, it's not just, it's just not just what they could do with this particular solution. It's what it implies uh, about the possibilities of all these appliances talking to each other in one seamless uh, system that it also has an interface like Google Now that you're probably going to be using anyway. Right. And so right. that's super powerful. And of course, Google has already, Google and their partners have already demonstrated home automation with Google Glass. Right now, Google Glass is a big, clunky, dorky thing. In the future, it'll just be seamlessly almost invisible inside your the glasses you're already wearing. And so it'll be something uh, altogether different to be able to interface your appliances. One of the most uh, interesting home automation solutions for Google Glass is that uh, control exists. So you can basically call up the control for every de any device you happen to be looking at, and you can sit, you know, turn it up, turn it down, set the timer, or whatever, and it's all in floating in space in front of you. They're not physical buttons, physical controls. And, of course, you don't have to be standing in front of the device to do that. You can do it in the other room. Very convenient. So it's an exciting, uh, it's an exciting uh, area. And I also think it has to... Uh, be said that uh, we, we reported yesterday that Quirky is launching Wink, which is another similar, kind of similar e uh, effort uh, on the part of Quirky. Quirky's, Quirky's a sort of startup-oriented uh, company where they take inventions and they turn them into products you can buy. Wink is a platform that's uh, designed to automate the, uh, you know, and bring together the Internet of Things and home automation and that sort of thing. Nest also said that more than 5,000 developers expressed interest in this platform. I don't know if that's a yeah, lot yeah. or not a lot. You, you know what, like Mike? I, I think that really caught my attention as well. And and the question always there, the question there always is, is, well, what do you mean by interest, expressed interest? Are they really on board or are they not? The fastest way to freeze a market as, as small startups begin to come into this market is to be the giant and claim all your developers are going to rally around you. And building on some of the themes you just shared, if, if you look out uh, a few months or a few years, could we actually see appliances with some sort of something similar to the Intel Inside campaign from years ago where it's Nest Inside for all these appliances? And and what about energy ratings and star ratings, things of that nature? Does some, Google somehow spin that forward? So, and, and, and take it then to the next level. So you've got the hardware providers maybe with these logo programs and then you have the software developers writing the apps to get onto the hardware and you could have a really you can really interesting ecosystem emerging here but um you know i keep coming back to those keywords that uh that google used and that was expressed interest a lot of people expressed interest in things that doesn't mean they're going to act on them yeah it, it means that they didn't have the 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 gall to to, say no. uh, to tell <laughs> google to take a hike we're not even going to think about it go you know Get out of here, you know. Oh, that's another interested party. We've got another sign up. Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean anything really. Uh, but but I do think that they will get interest if it's a elegant platform. If mm -hmm. Google really gets behind it, the thing that I'm curious about is what is Google going to announce tomorrow at Google I/O? Are they going to push this as the home automation solution, or are they going to offer an alternative? Google's very comfortable with offering multiple alternatives to everything. And uh, that kind of leaves developers with uh, scratching their heads and not really sure which way to proceed. But if they get completely behind Nest Labs solution here, forget about it. It's going to be a very important standard for home automation. So we'll see how that goes. Um, we'll learn more. You know, we'll know more this time tomorrow uh, whether Google's going to get all the way behind this, whether they're going to resurrect their Android at home platform. Um, if I had to uh, guess, if I had to predict, I would say that they're probably going to have multiple platforms. They're probably going to talk about an Android at home type solution. Plus, they're going to have this. They'll probably trot out the Nest Labs founders, uh, Tony Fidel and Matt Rogers uh, on stage. Uh, but, but I think they're going to have probably multiple platforms. We'll see how it goes. Um, we'll also probably see some 
integration with with Android Wear so that you can use your your uh, wearable device to control your uh, garage door opener. So yeah, yeah. and and then Mike, one one closing thought from me on this is, um, you know, yes. Google has a lot of different platforms, but if you really think about it, where do all lead, all roads lead to right now? I, I increasingly believe that everything Google announces at, at I.O., there'll be some sort of Google Cloud platform hook, meaning that as Google tries to compete more effectively against Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure, anything that Google announces, they want people to move their workloads, their new apps, their new initiatives, their new developments over to the Google Cloud platform. So we'll be watching that closely, too. Well, uh, in just a sec, we're going to hear about Microsoft, who is making an offer to Mac fanboys that they won't be able to refuse. But first, I want to tell you about Gazelle. Gazelle wants to buy your used gadgets. Why would you want to sell your used gadgets to Gazelle? So you can buy a new gadget. Uh, I love Gazelle. I've been using them for quite a while. And one of the things I love about them is they are so easy to use. And I'm very lazy. It's a perfect combination. Uh, they just uh, basically, you go to their website, G A Z E L L E dot com. You find the item that you have that you'd like to sell them, even if you're not sure you want to sell, even if you think you maybe kind of sort of might want to sell someday. Just go there, plug it in. It takes just a couple of seconds. It's really easy to do. Then you tell what the condition is. Oh, it's in perfect condition, it's in moderate condition, it's broken. They might even buy your broken device, believe it or not. And then they'll give you a price. That price is, price is locked in for 30 days. They send you a box. You throw it in the box. They give you a sticker with the addressing on it. You just put that on the top of the box and off it goes. And you get paid. You get paid fast by check, PayPal, or if you use the Amazon gift card option, you get an extra 5%, which is really great. Especially, again, you know, if they're going to pay you $300 for your old device, 5% of, of of, of $300 is a lot of money. That's a, a, on Amazon. You can uh, buy a case for your uh, new device or whatever. So just go to Gazelle and get an offer for your used Android or Apple products. And the best part, in my opinion, is that they put these devices back into circulation. It's really not great for these, uh, these gadgets to be collecting dust in a drawer or whatever. And if you don't love your gadget, you need to upgrade to one that you do love. Gazelle has paid more than $100 million to over 700,000 happy customers. And so you really have to check out gazelle.com. So find out what your Apple or Android device is worth. Take a minute. Go to gazelle.com to find out. And do it now because your device may lose value the longer you wait. Well, Joe, what's Microsoft up to now? They really uh, have an interesting offer for people using MacBook Airs. Yeah, Microsoft is out screaming discounts, discounts today to any MacBook Air users. And, and the whole strategy goes something like this. And I think there's, there's two things we want to cover here. Number one, a special discount offer for MacBook Air customers that want Surface Pro 3. We'll cover that a little bit. What is that offer? And then part two, Mike, I think the bigger question here for us to discuss is, even if you're interested in this offer, maybe you are, maybe you're not, does Surface Pro 3 really compare well to a full-blown laptop replacement, particularly heads up against the MacBook Air. So what exactly is this, this discount offer? What Microsoft has announced here is an offer that um, basically gives you about more than $650 or roughly $650 towards any Surface Pro 3 purchase, but you got to be a, a MacBook Air user. And uh, you do have to read the fine print. My Information Week and others are noting here that uh, it, it's not always $650. It really depends on the condition of your MacBook Air, et cetera. So great. Sounds like a great offer. In some cases, you, you may pay as little as $150 for a Surface Pro 3. But, but Mike, I'm wondering, um, are you really going to trade in that MacBook Air? I mean, Apple customers tend to be fanatical in terms of liking the products. Have you seen any reviews out there or any early buzz, Mike, in terms of whether or not customers may be willing to do this and what the reporters are saying? Okay, there are two issues here, and you, you hit the nail right on the head, is that the, you know, first of all, it's a different kind of device, and second of all, it's a different kind of user. So mm. if you look at the reviews, the review, most of the reviews I've read have been very straightforward looking, you know, a cost benefit, and they, they run the gamut from the MacBook Air is way better than the Surface Pro 3, all the way to they're about the same. That, that's mm -hmm. pretty much the range. On balance, the reviewers are throwing it toward the MacBook Air, even though it's a little bit more expensive. So that gives a slight edge uh, to, the, uh, to the Surface Pro 3. Now, Lance Ulanoff had an interesting uh, piece uh, that essentially was very praiseworthy of the, uh, 
of, of the Surface Pro 3 and said that he would love to use it and it's a very functional. He went into all kinds of details, but he started his piece by talking about how it's just a completely different user. If somebody's using mm. a MacBook Air, first of all, you, you know, the number of people they're talking about who could take advantage of this offer just gets narrower and narrower with each criteria. So they would have to be somebody who's willing to move to a Windows device to replace their Mac, right? So that's what percentage of, of Mac and Mac you know, Apple fans are going to do that. Very low. Second of all, they have to be ready to upgrade right now. This this uh, this expires pretty soon, like next month or something like that, right? Uh, there's an expiration date coming up very soon, so they'd have to be, it would have to fall within their window where they want to make a change of, uh, of this kind. Uh, and, and then they would have to, you know, it's not just moving from a Mac to Windows, but it's like, you know, you have to move everything. And now you, if you have a, a, a cloud backup solution you have to now move to the other version and which is a new account for example on carbonite or something like that if you if you're using uh, cloud storage like that you have to get another account they won't you can't just kick over the same account you have to get all your software you have to get more hardware you have to get a keyboard for the uh surface pro the the, the price that uh, microsoft says uh, often quotes is the price without a keyboard a Mac. Yeah, you know, and, and Mike, ironically enough, most of the reviews I've seen uh, have basically said that, to Microsoft's credit, they're really closing the gap here pretty quickly. Um, Surface Pro getting better and better and better. So kudos to them on that. But so ironic, you, you design a beautiful product, you make a, a great user interface in terms of or, or the, uh, the screen quality. But the keyboard seems to be the limiting factor in so many uh, so many reviews I'm I'm reading. Sarah Silbert over at Engadget, one of our uh, co-anchors here, basically pointed out that she tried the uh, the Surface Pro three for for a few days, really loved it, but in the end she switched back to the MacBook, uh, excuse me, to the Air because of um, because of the keyboard uh, as one of the key reasons. So it, it's so interesting that you can send, spend so much on the on the overall user interface look and feel and it, and at the end of the day it's just the typing yeah absolutely and and they, you know microsoft has an enormous audience of existing windows users of business people of lots of people who are the perfect people to target right. the surface pro 3 at and then they go after people they'll never get and they're in their you know they obsess over mm -hmm. this this smaller group of people you know the people who use a macbook air compared to the people using windows I mean, it's, right. Windows is massively, you know, it's massive. Uh, and you, their message should be, hey, all you Windows people, finally, there's a, something that has all the benefits of the, like, the super nice, you know, iPads and MacBook Airs, but it's Windows and you can, you know, it's real Windows and all that kind of stuff. That's the message that will sell this thing. Not like, hey, you f Apple fanboys want to switch to Microsoft. It's yeah, never going to fly. It may not fly, and even worse, here, here's the irony. Uh, big, big Microsoft partners. Look at a company like Lenovo. Lenovo has spent years and years designing its laptops to, and promoting its laptops as alternatives to, to MacBook Air. Now you have Microsoft coming along saying, wait a minute, Surface Pro 3 is actually the full-blown alternative to, to MacBook Air. And boy, you know, the, the big PC partners like Lenovo have got to be a little bit upset that Microsoft's moved from, hey, we're in the tablet market to now we're in the full-blown PC replacement market. Hey, we'll say we're going up against Apple, but what they're really saying is we're a replacement for everything at this point. Yeah, good point. Well, in other Microsoft news, Microsoft launched its first ever Android phone today, as expected. It's called the Nokia X2, as expected, and it costs 135 bucks. has a 4.3-inch display, 1.2 gigahertz Snapdragon dual-core processor, 16 gigs of RAM, and a 5-megapixel rear-facing camera. In other words, it's a pretty middle-of-the-road, kind of not-that-exciting device, but it's Microsoft selling an Android phone. Steve Ranger is the UK editor-in-chief of ZDNet and Tech Republic and joins us now to talk about this strange turn of events. How's it going, Steve? Yeah, very good, thanks. Yeah, it is, it is kind of strange. I mean, a couple of years ago, if you'd heard Microsoft was launching an Android phone, you think, well, what is going on here? But yeah, this is, this is part of the new Microsoft, the new uh, mobile-first, cloud-first Microsoft that's just trying all kinds of new things. And, of course, uh, Microsoft had gotten a huge amount of trouble a decade and a half ago for bundling their Internet Explorer browser with Windows. Here they are selling an Android device running, dun-dun-dun, Opera. <laughs> it is. It's the sort of thing that if a couple of years ago someone had said this to you, you would have thought they were crazy. But really, this is just how much Microsoft has changed in the last few years, particularly in the last year or so. It really is just opening up, trying out a few new things, and, and maybe it's... It's less about uh, necessarily selling you Windows. It's more about 
the services that sit on top of that, whether it's Bing or Outlook or cloud storage or whatever. So it's less it's less just about that old core business and more about looking at new opportunities, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. Um, this, the, the, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, these, these Android phones might not take off. They might not be the thing. But what's interesting is it's an, it's an absolutely new idea for Microsoft to, to maybe just throw a few things out there and see, and see what fit, and see what sticks. So, Steve, it, it sounds like the strategy here is for Microsoft to use these products as a delivery platform for all the other Microsoft services. So, with that thought in mind, how aggressively do you think Microsoft will get behind these phones, these Android devices? And do you think it's just a U.S. play, just a Europe play? Is it both? What are your thoughts so far? So, it, it looks like this is much more of a, an emerging market play. So, uh, Microsoft was saying this, this phone is selling uh, the... the uh, uh, Nokia X is selling uh, well in Russia, for example. So I, I think they're trying to build a, a model where maybe their Asher models and the Nokia X models are uh, targeting uh, very budget conscious uh, emerging markets. And then don't forget, they're still putting a huge amount of effort into Windows Phone at the high end. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting, uh, intriguing idea. They might not put a huge amount of uh, push behind it if it doesn't, doesn't catch on pretty quickly, but pretty quickly you can see absolutely that uh, these, these budget phones can uh, kind of Get, get people intrigued who might never buy a, a, a Windows PC, but uh, it's about it's kind of like a, it's an on ramp for new customers who uh, who would otherwise be lured away to to Android, which of course is incredibly strong, particularly the budget end because it's it's so cheap. Now this is supposed to be a mid range phone. It seems a little low for a mid range phone, but uh, compared to the first Nokia X which is a very low-end phone. What are some of the differences that uh, we know about so far about the difference between the X2 and the X? Uh, so it looks like uh, this one's got a bit of a, uh, a few slight upgrades. It's not, you're right, this is not a, I would, I would put this in more of the, sort of the budget category rather than mid-range. Um, uh, the other complications, of course, that um, there are the Asher phones, which Nokia has made as well, uh, which target pretty much the same audience. Uh, and of course, uh, something like the, the new Lumia, so something like the 630, that's also quite, a, a, quite an attractive uh, uh, handset in this market. So I think basically Microsoft is trying a whole bunch of things here, you know, whether it's a low-end uh, Windows phone, whether it's an Asher, whether it's a Nokia X. They, they're just trying, to see, just trying to play with a few things, which I think is, is, is kind, of, kind of different for Microsoft. You, you expect them to be quite monolithic, to have one idea and, and kind of stick with it. I think really they're, they're just trying to think about a few ideas and, and, seeing, uh, and seeing which one works. Yeah, and on the one hand, it won't be difficult for them to match or exceed sales of Windows phones because they don't sell all that well compared to other brands from Apple and Samsung and others. Uh, but on the on the other hand, it may be embarrassing if their if their Android phone sells better than their Windows phone. Still, we'll see what uh, comes of it, and uh, it'll be an interesting uh, ongoing experiment to see how what kind of an Android phone vendor. Microsoft is. Uh, Steve Ranger is the UK Editor-in-Chief of ZDNet and Tech Republic, and he can be found at ZDNet.com and also on Twitter at Steve Ranger. Thank you so much, Steve Ranger, for coming on Tech News today. Always a pleasure. All right. Well, Joe, what's happening in Twitter? Looks like, in Russia, it looks like uh, they're having a little uh, uh, tassel with Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> you know, there's a lot going on in Russia, and and the latest uh, latest company or organization to be involved in some of the uh, the elbow uh, fights involves Twitter, of course. Now, apparently, Russia is asking Twitter to block extremist accounts. So, how is Twitter responding? Is is the big question? And then, longer term, how will social networks deal with such requests like this in the future? Really big questions and issues to ponder. And, and here to offer some insights is Sarah Fryer, a tech reporter over at Bloomberg. Sarah, welcome to Tech News Today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you aboard. Thank you so much for joining us today. So t what can you tell us about Russia's concerns here and Russia's request to Twitter so far? Well, it sounds like Twitter is, is trying to um, to play nice to both sides, right? So they are sending a group of people, inclu including their p public policy chief, Colin Crowell, to the country to meet with officials and tell them, hey, here's how you can try to get an account blocked if you want to. You know, not saying we condone censorship, but, you know, if something is breaking your laws, here's how you do it. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a little bit of confusion yesterday because Russia said, oh, Twitter has promised that they'll block these these 10 extremist accounts and then Twitter had to say, no, we didn't promise anything. You know, we just showed them our policies. So I think that there already is some miscommunication here and some, um, 
some expectation by Russian officials that they can block more than than uh, what Twitter is going to want them to. And of course, we saw something similar in Turkey ahead of the elections. Um, Twitter was asked to block some accounts, and they actually went to court over it and eventually ended up blocking them for a little bit before the election was over. Yeah, you know, so I was going to ask, it's a, it's a natural follow-on question, are requests like this unique, or, is, or do you see this as a growing trend going forward as, as governments try to deal with extremists and, and censor those extremists? I think that, that an extremist in one country is not an extremist in another country. Mm -hmm. You know, it, people ha governments have different ideas about what is a threat to their authority, and definitely they're they're realizing that their citizens are going to use these social media services, whether you know through the the networks or behind a firewall or whatever they, um, however they get to it, they're going to be using them. So their um, strategy, as opposed to banning it from all their citizens is to go to the companies and say, hey, help us out. Um, and, and I think the companies see a, a little bit of a, a strategy there and like, okay, well, we don't want to have all of Twitter gone for Russia. You know, we need to think about what is, what is the extent of what we can do without violating um, people's right to say what they think. And of course, as China has demonstrated, it's always possible to block entire services to censor social media, whether they're inside uh, the country of the authoritarian government or not. Uh, and these threats are coming, yeah, as you absolutely. mentioned. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Turkey, you mentioned, uh, we're talking about Russia here. I mentioned China. Uh, we haven't talked about Iraq, where ISIS, which is currently you know, an Islamic fundamentalist uh, movement uh, within that country, is very effective at using social media. And, you know, what's what's the judgment call for Twitter on those kinds of things? But personally, I think that the biggest potential threat uh, of all of this social media uh, censorship is coming from, of all places, Canada. Uh, now, oh, really? uh, yeah, uh, uh, last week or within the last week and a half or so, a Canadian court ordered Google to remove search results, not just for Canada, but for but worldwide and not just specific results, but all current and future results mentioning a specific company now this is that's, that's happened in europe too um the, there's the the new um right to be forgotten yes. that's being um uh, approved by courts right the difference is that in europe the right to be forgotten case is a case-by-case -case basis where somebody with a grievance grievance goes to uh google uh and other uh, companies, it's it's uh, applied across all the search engine vendors, and then Google makes a judgment call, and then there's a process for uh, follow-up court cases. In the case of Canada, they ordered Google preemptively to remove all mentions of a specific company in the future because the you know the company in this case is two small, pretty irrelevant companies. Uh, they're not tech companies. They're not large companies, but but essentially one of them kept making a website that was ruled in the Canadian court system to be invalid and uh, uh, trampling on the the, the uh, trademarks of the other company. Uh, but they kept building new sites, and the order from the court was keep snuffing out those new sites as they emerge. Uh, but the precedent uh, of, a of a country being able to censor globally, so you can see Russia doing this or China doing this. Let's say China, for example, ordering Twitter to say, you have to censor not you know the, uh, the Falun Gong, not only in China, but in the U.S. as well. So you, you know the idea that we have a, that we could have a precedent being set here that a national government could censor globally, not just within the country. I think is extremely dangerous, and, and I think that it's just a matter of time before the the Vladimir Putins of the world decide to order Twitter to do exactly that to censor globally. Yeah, I think you know, you're right. You're I think also, it's definitely a, a slippery slope, and and when you're looking at at these companies, I mean Twitter Twitter itself has just gotten so far by being this beacon of free speech and, you know, anyone can say what they want. We, you know, we, we know the legacy with the Arab Spring protests. And these companies have to be careful about how, how far they're willing to go with these countries um, without damaging their own reputations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, almost, you almost wonder what's going to come next with, with Egypt, with the whole situation there. And, uh, you know, the, the U.S. being hopeful that leadership there uh, will, will take the right steps going forward. But um, if there is another, uh, let's call it uprising, so to speak, um, 
what might the government there do in terms of outreach to Twitter and how might Twitter respond? I mean, it, it, it seems like a, a more than a slippery slope. It's almost like you're, you're standing on the knife's edge every time and one wrong move could really wind up cutting you badly. Well, there's a Absolutely. fundamental, yeah, there's a fundamental flaw in all this, which is that it's not like the phone system. In the phone system, you can't, you know, traditionally, you couldn't really censor it. People can pretty much say what they wanted on a phone. And the phone company was not expected to censor anything or monitor anything. On social networks, all of them, there is censorship. There is censorship for political reasons. There's censorship for criminal reasons. You know, in Germany, for example, in France, you can't show Nazi-related uh, material. There's a million reasons to censor. And so these social networks have to censor. There's, you know... Uh, uh, child pornography. There's all these uh, issues around which people agree that there should be censorship, which means that it's not just an open pipe. Uh, they're not just a neutral observer. Social networks have to make judgments about who are the good guys and who are the bad guys and what's legal and what's illegal and what's moral and what's immoral. And, and it's really problematic. And there's no right answer for any of this. Uh, but it's interesting uh, to see what Twitter does here. Uh, now, uh, now, Sarah, what do you think will be the ultimate response of the Russian government? Do you think they're going to come back yet again and say, no, your, your uh, suggestion that we, uh, that, that we uh, tailor and, uh, this is, 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 uh, is unacceptable? And are they going to insist that individual accounts be permanently removed? I mean, I think that, you know, whether they're suspended or removed or blocked, I mean, there's all, a number of things that, that you can do. And, and I think that, you know, if, if the government wants to do a power play with Twitter, they they totally could. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't know that it'll be um, much different from what we've seen in other places where where countries have tried to block the service, where um, people have you know tried to block accounts, and and over time, um, Twitter has come up with this country withheld content rule. So even if something is blocked in Russia, it can still be seen elsewhere in the world. So that's one of their compromises, right? Like we'll make this government happy, but you know, if if Russian users want to see the content, they just have to log on to the U.S. version of Twitter or the German version of Twitter, and and it'll be there. And that's also true for the right to be forgotten stuff in Europe. Just log on to the U.S. version, and there is all of the stuff that they. Uh, were ordered to block. Sarah Fryer is a tech reporter at Bloomberg. You can find her at Bloomberg.com and on Twitter at Sarah Fryer, unless the Russian government bans her account. Sarah <laughs> Fryer, I want to thank you for coming on Tech News today. Very insightful. Thanks again. Thank you. All right. Well, Twitter may be testing a new feature that would enable you to add your own comments to retweets and have those comments appear in their entirety along with the original tweet in its entirety. Joining us to talk about this possible change is Chris Gaiamali, a staff writer for Fast Company. Welcome, Chris. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Glad you're here. Now, how was this test discovered? Uh, this actually came about and was discovered somewhat by accident, wasn't it? Right, right. Um, so what happened was a Mashable reporter spotted that there was actually this weird way that a Twitter employee was embedding another tweet within their tweets. And what would happen is this, this whole Twitter card would pop up that kind of had the entirety of the tweet inside of it. And it's a very, it's a really interesting way to get around sort of um, this archaic notion that Twitter is confined to this 140 character limit. Yeah, uh, is is that really the key takeaway here? Is is it the death of the 140 character limit in your mind? Right. Well, well, the thing is, Twitter um, looks like it's been experimenting with a couple of features that sort of uh, let users um, cram, I guess, more stuff into a tweet without actually having to eat up the character limit. For example, they did this thing recently where um, they were supposedly moving hashtags and ad replies, uh, the scaffolding of Twitter, if you will, uh, sort of to the background. And it's kind of like how you tag someone on a Facebook post or sort of use hashtags over there. And I think it's, it's, it's really interesting because it's sort of this clever workaround that um, lets Twitter get away while still like... Um, retaining the 140 character limit that sort of has been critical to it, like ex ex um, excelling this far. Now, Chris Guyamel, you, you had uh, illustrated in your piece uh, with some screenshots the fact that this effect did not take place in the web version of Twitter. It, ta it, it, it appeared on the mobile version. Do you, 
do you think that, that that's what they're testing, right. the possibility that they would have two different views on mobile and on the web? Right, right. Well, I think I think um, the thing is with Twitter that um, it's it always says that it's testing new features and, you know, um, it's very, there have been features that have not made it out into public use. Um, I think mobile is interesting because I think that's where most of the eyeballs are. Um, and I think Twitter seems to understand that going forward, like if you're going to embed these new features, you need to appeal to that mobile audience first and then the web audience second. Yeah, definitely. Well, Chris Guy O'Malley, I want to thank you for coming on Tech News today. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks for having me, guys. All right. You can find Chris uh, at fastcompany.com and on, on Twitter at Chris Guy O'Malley. Well, Joe, Oracle uh, is uh, making an acquisition, and that has an interesting implication, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, it really does. And, and I don't think the implication has been explored much yet. So I'm happy we're bringing it up here. So imagine this, uh, Larry Ellison competing with Amazon Fire. So mm. does that does that mean Oracle is getting into the smartphone business? Not quite. But, you know, here, here's the thesis. Oracle this week, uh, just yesterday, confirmed that they're spending $5.3 to buy out Micros. Now, if you're not familiar with Micros, what you need to know is, is there quote unquote, in the point of sale market. They make the uh, digital cash registers, anything you see in, in a retail store chain and restaurants, uh, in, in, in all types of uh, retail organizations. Um, so now let's apply that and compare and contrast that to what Amazon's been up to with, with the Fire smartphone. Basically, the, smart, uh, the Fire smartphone, uh, although it's a smartphone, Mike, you've mentioned it, I've mentioned it, we really view it as a digital cash register, a mobile cash register where you can go in uh, to a store and, and do some browsing, look at the various products, and then do sort of your own bait and switch as the consumer and go buy everything on Amazon rather than at the point of sale location in the retail store. So I'm very curious to see if, if Ellison does some uh, innovation here or if he's just going to milk micros for, for cash flow going forward. But um, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see because... Uh, Ellison is a sharp guy. And, and on the one hand, uh, Micros doesn't sound like the sexiest company in the world. But on the other hand, they've got uh, 330,000 customers out there. Yeah, in 180 countries, they're very international. Uh, and uh, this is a $5.3 billion in cash deal, which, by the way, is the biggest deal Oracle's made in five years, biggest since they bought Sun Microsystems for about $7.4 billion in 2009. I think that in addition, you know, it's an interesting thesis and it, it implies also that Amazon is going to get into the brick and mortar cash register business, which I believe they will. I think that the whole point of the uh, Amazon Fire Phone and the, the radical, uh, you know, the, the Firefly feature, which enables showrooming, which means mm -hmm. you go into a store, you see something you like, you push the Firefly button and, and it gives you a buy button and it shows up at your house the next day, uh, one day delivery. Uh, you really can't beat that unless, if you and if you can't beat them, you join them. So what you do, if you're Best Buy or if you're you know Macy's or whatever, then you partner with Amazon and you enable people to buy the product that's right in front of them uh, through Amazon. Amazon gets a cut of that. That seems like a no-brainer next move for Amazon to not only uh, take money from brick and mortar, but to co-opt brick and mortar and to to bring them into the fold and kind of force them to play uh, according to Amazon's playbook. If they do that, which again, I believe they will, now they're competing directly against the future of Apple. Apple wants to turn every retail store into an Apple store in terms of how you buy things. You do it with your phone. You would just walk up and you, you know, scan the device and you walk out, you know, with an electronic receipt, no cash registers. And and again, you know, uh, Oracle's buy here is, is cash registers and, internet connected cash registers, smart cash registers, if you will. And so the, the, those are, I believe, the three companies that are going to be competing against each other. It's Well, th those are the three in our space in the world of technology. Uh, there are point of sale systems that are not really household names uh, in the world of technology, but for technology, we're looking at Micros uh, plus Oracle uh, and mm -hmm. Apple and Amazon. If uh, the future of Apple and Amazon is going in the direction that I think it is. So it's an interesting um, theory, Joe, and we'll keep an eye on it. Um, but one way or the other, this is an enormous acquisition, $5.3 billion. That is yeah. a lot of money for a, a company huge like this. 
big a uh, big sum of money of course and the other angle here is oracle last week put out financials quarterly results and on the one hand wall street was a little bit disappointed with with oracle and the fact that the company isn't growing faster on the other hand oracle was quick to spin their cloud story forward and and talking about how quickly their cloud business is growing oracle claims to be the number two cloud company now behind salesforce.com it, it's almost like oracle saying hey we're avis we try harder and uh, they're, they're making a run at Salesforce in the cloud market. And micros, on the one hand, okay, they're a cash register business. On the other hand, take a closer look, folks. It's a cloud-enabled cash register or point-of-sale business. So this really spins Oracle's cloud story forward in a big way as well. We'll be watching that closely. It absolutely does. And uh, thank you so much for uh, bringing that perspective to the show today, Joe. Well, that's the tech news today. Joe Panateri, uh, thanks again for, for uh, co-anchoring today. You're our Tuesday guy. And it's great to be here to Tuesday. Right. <laughs> Maybe next week I won't be muted. We'll see. We'll see. I will see about I that. Think, <laughs> I think Jason enjoys it, frankly. <laughs> so. I think we should just run with it every week. Let's go just, with it. That's right. Well, you can subscribe to Tech News today at twit.tv slash TNT. And we want to hear from you, so send us email at TNT at twit.tv. Also, watch and subscribe to our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific, tonight and every weeknight. And don't miss tomorrow's special Google I.O. edition of Tech News Today, hosted by the one and only Leo Laporte, which starts one hour earlier at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you Thursday, and you'll see Leo tomorrow.